In this class we're concerned with the role of trade unions. Now a definition of a trade union may be as follows. An organisation, whether temporary or permanent, which consists wholly or mainly of workers, whose principal purposes include the regulation of relations between workers and employers or employers association. And that's quite a good definition. It's a trade union is an organization which brings together workers uh, out of a sense of common interest to promote their welfare, to promote their working conditions and uh, their remuneration. And it deals with the employers. So it's it's one side of the industrial relations uh, setup. The other side being the employers. So trade unions are associations that represent employees at work. The main purpose of the trade union is to improve the conditions of the employees. The, the main purpose is to promote the interest of the employees uh, in terms of remuneration, conditions uh, of employment, uh, health and safety, overall regulation of work to ensure that the workers have a good standard of living and are properly remunerated for their efforts and they are safe at work. So trade unions have various functions. The trade union focuses on better pay for example and working conditions for the employees as I said. Uh, they play a role in legislation and policies that benefit employees as well. So the trade unions are involved with government legislation. Uh, they influence governments regarding uh, industrial relations and employee relations as it's called nowadays. So they, they try to ensure that the interests of the workers are promoted and advanced through legislation and through negotiations with their uh, counterparts uh, in the industrial relations scene. In other words, they're able to negotiate with the employers directly. They came, they came into existence to bring together workers and to build a platform for employee voice. The whole idea behind the trade unions was that the workers could come together and speak with one voice and hence they were much stronger and the employers would have to listen to them. If, a, if there was no trade unions then one worker may have to go to the employer and try to negotiate better terms. Well that one worker is in a weak position. So if all the workers join together and go and see the employers they're in a much stronger position. They have introduced positive changes in society. For example, the national minimum wage ensures that employees receive no less than a minimum hourly rate. Now this doesn't apply in all countries, but in some countries it applies. And it is quite controversial because employers say, well, if the hourly rate is, is too high, then it may cause unemployment because the employers won't employ as many workers it's too expensive. Uh, other people would say well the national minimum wage is already very low and therefore uh, is just about enough to sustain a person uh, to pay for accommodation and clothing and food and transport pay for the essentials. So it's debatable but many people think it's a positive force it is uh, something that the trade unions were instrumental in getting in society. But as I said, not all countries have got it. There's an increased, increased awareness uh, of, the, uh, of the situation of children in industry. And uh, this, this now is more widespread because of better communications in the world. We, we know that children are working under terrible conditions in some countries and governments are able to take action on that. And the, the trade unions have a voice in trying to publicize this and make us more aware of the fact that children are suffering uh, for economic reasons, but that the children are suffering in many countries working under terrible conditions. But also 
in the UK itself, children were used in industry uh, back in history and were used from very early ages and life expectancy was very low and families suffered, children suffered. So the trade unions publicised this, made it known and just on humanitarian grounds won the moral argument. And it was the trade unions who uh, fought for the the rights of children and the rights of people at work not to work under unsafe conditions and to work in healthy conditions and and have proper regulation at work so that people had rest periods and they were not working every day of the week working long hours they tried to introduce better standards of living by reducing work hours and promoting a healthy work-life balance, trying to get uh, people involved in uh, their families more and in, in their communities and the, the trade unions were instrumental in building up a sense of community in many areas. Um, in the UK we, we think of the mine workers in the past having very tight communities in some parts of the country and the whole community was orientated around the mine and about the the workers in the mine and they there was a sense of community and that was promoted by the trade unions and it was beneficial to the workers they, they didn't feel isolated or um, they didn't feel that they were somehow cut off from their families and from the community they felt a part of it so it was a quite a positive uh, contribution they also have, of course, influenced legislation over the years regarding parental leave, disability, discrimination, work harassment, um, and sickness entitlement. Uh, it's not right that someone should go to work and be discriminated against. If they can do the job and someone, somebody else can do the job, um, why should one person be paid less than another on the basis of the colour of their skin or because of their path, their background or their, their culture or, or whatever. They're doing the same job. So why not get the same pay? So they were instrumental in trying to bring about more equality at work. And to stop work harassment. It could be that some employers were bad. Because they were employers doesn't mean they were all good. Some employers could be bad and could, uh, could, could treat the workers badly perhaps. But also some workers, as, as humans do, they have illness and they don't want to uh, have an illness and stay off work and then lose their job as a consequence because their family would suffer, they would have no income. So at the time when trade unions were coming into existence it was a very harsh environment. But then again everyone was learning in that environment. The employers were learning as well. It was new to them, the same as it was to the workers. But it was trying to get a sense of balance between the two and trying to work out what was the right thing to do. The trade unions came into existence to try and promote the interest of the workers and try to get them what they saw as a fair deal. Now the aims and objectives of trade unions, well, to promote better terms of employment improved salaries, acceptable working hours and longer holiday packages. People are are human and as a consequence we need time off work, we need to recharge our batteries, we need to relax, we need to uh, recover. Work can be arduous and back at a time back in the say in the 17-1800s in the UK work was extremely hard and people needed to rest, they needed to recover so that they can go back and work again. So what's acceptable working hours? Should it work an 8 hour day or should it be a 10 hour day? It should be a 12 hour day. Well there's a limit to what people can do and perhaps the employers in, in their rush to develop and sort out the business and so on, they had 
uh, or greed indeed it could simply be because they were paying a, a wage they wanted to get as much as they could out of the workers but that was to the detriment of the, the health of the workers and of their families and and of the community and of the country indeed so it was the trade unions who who tried to organize the workers to enable them to negotiate better terms for work to have better wages better salaries and better working conditions and try to reduce the hours of work per day down to something which was reasonable so that humans can cope we we could go back and rest at the end of the day and not uh, damage our health better conditions of employment safe working practices implementations of health and safety standards and improve job prospects and job role so trying to all the time to improve conditions at work for the workers and this the trade unions would argue continues today and the trade unions do a lot of work in exposing bad employers in other parts of the world and pointing out that companies who import from those bad employers uh, those companies should desist, should stop from I importing from those people because they are exploiting their workers. They may have child labour or they may have sweatshops and have people working long hours for very little. And th that is wrong. So it was the trade unions who looked into this and looked at working practices, looked at health and safety when people go to work they don't expect to be hurt they don't expect to have uh, injuries they're going to do a job not to risk their lives and also workers need to have a sense of involvement with the work they needed to to think that if they did a good job they would be recognized as doing a good job and as trying hard Also, job security was a, an issue. Um, looking at employment contracts and looking at rights against redundancy and unfair dismissal, looking at pensions, uh, injury and sickness. These are all issues that that are important to workers. What happens when the worker gets too old to work? Will they have a pension? How will they live in their old age? And can they can the employer just make someone redundant? Uh, that person who's made redundant may have commitments, may have children who need to be looked after, may have families. So does the employer have any obligation to make some provision for redundancy and compensate the workers who are no longer required? What about unfair dismissal? The, the employer simply dismisses someone because he or she doesn't like them. That's unfair. So again the trade unions come into existence to try and stop these practices, to try and give better job security. Democracy at work. Um, the trade unions like the idea of the workers having some say in the work as well, being consulted and uh, having a sense of uh, involvement in the work and that employers will consult the workers and talk about changes they're proposing to make and involve the workers. So the workers are not just seen as, as uh, similar to capital. They are just the people who service the machines. So to move away from that, to involve the workers, ask their opinions and get them involved. In fact, it's, it's, it's a very good idea, as we've seen from other modules uh, on the course. Motivating workers so they come up with ideas and will feed back ideas and feed back their experiences and this can lead to greater efficiency and greater involvement, greater productivity. So involving the workers, that's important. The trade unions also work alongside governments to introduce laws and policies which benefit 
uh, employee rights at work. Um, the trade unions are constantly um, in contact with the government and involved in government organisations and uh, committees and consultative committees and so the trade unions are trying to all the time um, promote the interest of workers so they have uh, constant involvement with government organisations and constant contact with government ministers and making representation on the part of the employees and uh, they are constantly keeping the whole issue of employee rights and their safety at work and their interests keeping those on the table keeping them there in front of the government all the time so that the government factors those in when, when they're designing legislation. Now the objectives are achieved through collective bargaining and negotiations. The trade unions try to negotiate with the employers. Um, they, they, they form collective bargaining situations so they try to negotiate with the employers. They, they contact the employers when there's an issue, they try to get it resolved, they try to uh, promote the interest of their workers as I said earlier but to try to get a fair outcome one that is sustainable there's no point in just bullying through some solution because it's not going to stick but a fair solution <coughs> has more long-term and long-run uh, possibilities of surviving so uh, they engage in collective bargaining and in negotiations to try and influence the employers there's also joint consultation. These are meetings with management and representatives regarding management issues such as the relocation of a plant from one part of the country to another, or redundancies or health and safety issues. They have joint consultation. They have regular meetings with the management and talk about issues and the management should keep the trade unions informed about their plans, their strategic plans. What are they trying to do in the long run? Where do they want to be? And uh, what are their overall goals so that the there's no surprise for the workers the workers are able to plan their lives more effectively knowing what the management are thinking and planning they, do, they don't just arrive in one day and and be surprised although it does happen sometimes workers do arrive to find that the gates are locked and the company is closed down over the weekend um, but it's not fair because the workers who have turned up in good faith to do a day's work find they have now no employment and they have family commitments. So and there is joint consultation to try and ensure long run flow of information between the two sides. Union member services, well advice on matters concerning uh, legal issues, pension, long-term sickness support, uh, skills training, grievances, disciplinary guidance and so on. So the unions provide a range of services to their members. The members pay um, a small sum of money every week or every month to the trade union and in return the trade union employ specialists, they employ lawyers or solicitors as we say in the UK they employ them to give legal advice, they employ specialists to conduct health studies and um, to look at pensions and and give financial advice and so on. So this, they supply a range of services to the members that otherwise the members would find it difficult to to have. Now the types of associations, well there are different types of associations that support the aims and objectives of trade unionism. For example, the Trade Union Congress, the TUC. The Trade Union Congress is, and I'll talk about these later, but the Trade Union Congress is simply a collection of all the various unions, not just one union in the country. There are many unions in the country covering different trades, different occupations, different professions, different types of work. So the TUC is like an umbrella organisation that all of those can go and get support from. So they all fit under the TUC. 
there are staff associations uh, as well which, which uh, enable staff to to come together and get some protection sometimes we think of trade unions as being only related to uh, manual work to hard labouring work um, that's not the case people in offices need protection as well people in offices need the the power of trade unions to promote their interest um, now a lot of what I'm saying I realize is very controversial and there will be many people who will say uh, that I should present the other side and the case against trade unions and those will come in other modules elsewhere but for the moment we can see the logic behind having trade unions in this case and in this case staff of all types will benefit from the existence of trade unions in the context of what we're dealing with here so people in offices professional people will benefit from the existence of trade unions the civil service in the country who work for the government directly will benefit from the existence of a trade union there are also employer associations and federations um, the employers on their side have many associations and federations the, um, the confederation of british industry in the uk there are the institute of directors and chambers of commerce and there are many associations that the employers may have so on the one hand we have the workers coming together in trade unions on the other hand the employers come together for support as well then we have the advisory conciliation and arbitration service known as ACAS and ACAS exists in the UK to to try and bring about solutions to problems when there's an issue between the trade union on the one hand and the employers on the other and it seems to be intractable it, it can't be resolved there's a there's a, a big dispute between the two in this case ACAS could be involved and ACAS will get the two sides to come together and try and negotiate uh, a solution there are also pressure groups that influence the trade unions and also influence uh, employers and there are all sorts of pressure groups some of them quite subtle some of them may just be uh, advocating a particular stance a particular way of going forward uh, that suits their particular interest and they may do this through publishing articles or uh, having small meetings or trying to influence uh, the trade union on the one hand or indeed you get the same on the employer side we get pressure groups on the employer side as well um, within the trade union movement in the history of trade unions uh, there was quite a um, an interest in in the distant past of using pamphlets small very very small publications uh, little booklets advocating particular policies or particular ways forward and these were quite popular and used to disseminate ideas amongst the members now let's look at the trade union congress well it's a voluntary organization uh, established to be the voice of employees as I said earlier it's an umbrella organization it contains all the various trade unions so in the UK there are many trade unions there's a trade union for uh, the, the post um, trade union for general workers there's a trade union for the civil service there's a trade union for rail workers and trade union for teachers and so on and the TUC is where they all meet and work out their overall policy regarding government legislation or regarding some initiative the government wants to take and the TUC may support it or may object to it but then in this case the government is facing one opponent almost the TUC but it's a very strong opponent because it contains all of the trade unions or most of the trade unions and the trade unions have members so the government takes into account what the TUC is saying 
The organisation runs annual meetings to discuss policies, debates and current issues regarding employee welfare. Every year in the UK the TUC has a very large meeting, a congress it's called, and they, they meet and discuss all sorts of issues associated with uh, employment, workers' rights, uh, remuneration, government policy. They even discuss issues uh, associated with international trade. They talk about the fairness of international trade and outsourcing and uh, job losses to other countries and working conditions in other countries. And they have uh, sympathy for and relationships with trade unions in other countries and try to support those. A committee is arranged to formulate policy for the UK trade union movement. Um, the, the TUC is a very sophisticated organisation. There are many specialists that work for the TUC, legal ex, uh, expertise and organisational expertise, and they have committees that constantly monitor government policy and constantly monitor uh, the economic conditions in the country and also look at what's happening internationally and keep the, the TUC and the membership informed of what, what's going on. So the, the, the news as comes from the TUC is based on expert opinion and it's provided to the members. It liaises with industry and government bodies to discuss current issues in legislation. The TUC uh, is constantly uh, in contact with government and with relevant government ministers, employment ministers, industry ministers, uh, business ministers and so on. It's constantly in contact with these and constantly monitoring their policies and looking at the implications of the policies and making recommendations and recommendations for change and recommendations for future courses of action. So the TUC is constantly involved. It doesn't mean necessarily the government's going to take their advice. Sometimes governments disagree with them and go the other way. In which case there may be a dispute between the two sides which could lead to strike action or uh, discontent of various forms. But as far as the TUC is concerned, it is constantly, if you like, agitating towards better employee conditions, more information for the employees, and also trying to promote the idea of fairness at work internationally. The TUC intervene in disputes and strikes. They, uh, they are approached to agree a settlement between employers and workforce. Sometimes when a trade union and an employer has a dispute, it may lead to a stoppage of work. The workers stop work to, to damage the interest of the employer, to force the employer to make concessions. Clearly, the workers can only stop work for some time because they've got family commitments, they need, they need a wage, they need a salary to live. So, generally speaking, the workers can't stay out for a long time. But they could damage the company, the reliability of the company, the lead times the companies have promised, the aftercare service to the customers that the company had promised. These could be damaged. The reputation of the company could be damaged. So the employers try to avoid strike. But so also do the workers. So strikes are a last course of action. It's not something both sides go for straight away. But when there is a, a big issue between them and, and there doesn't seem to be a way of solving it, they can look for advice from the TUC and the trade unions may invite in the TUC to make recommendations and if if everything is still failing they may go to ACAS the advisory conciliation and arbitration service I mentioned earlier may go to them and, and agree to arbitration in other words <coughs> both of them state their case in front of a committee and the committee will decide which one is right and they agree to that but it, it may be negotiations it may be give and take on both sides to try and find a solution 
Um, the TUC investigate any claims or complaints by union members or employees. Um, sometimes perhaps the local trade union have made mistakes or uh, people within the local trade union are not behaving appropriately as well and perhaps the workers are not very happy with the local the local trade union uh, membership or, or committee in which case they can go a little higher and uh, ask for an investigation what what is going on what's what's the policy of these people and why are they leading us into so many disputes and and so on so the TUC is a check on the trade unions the membership uh, the, the tr individual members and it, it tries to balance out the conflicting requirements of the employers on the one hand, the employees on the other, but also the trade union that represents the employees to make sure that they are fairly presenting the case. I mentioned staff association earlier. Um, staff associations are representatives who support employees within a workforce. Um, sometimes employees they they have the, the the trade union but they may also have a staff association they may have uh, an agreement between themselves at work similar to uh, not quite a works council because that normally involves the employers but a staff association where locally very locally the employees can meet and talk about issues that directly affect them directly affect their work where they are where they spend their time, what they do, uh, the conditions of employment. So the staff association is is them talking to their colleagues. The staff association are elected by employees to voice their concerns to management. So the staff association may uh, elect someone to act as their spokesperson who will then go to the management and say there are issues in in the factory over certain machinery or certain safety issues or the lighting is not good here or the ventilation is not good or whatever so they try to constantly make management aware that there are issues and to deal with the issues um, staff associations are good methods for developing workforce power a group has more influence over decision making than individual employees so group action is much stronger than individual action and having a, a staff association where uh, locally within particular parts of the company uh, not even within the whole company perhaps within particular parts of the company uh, the workers have got together and and have identified issues and uh, situations that need improvement have elected someone to speak as their spokesperson and uh, it's it's a much stronger position to be in the employer association and federations well employers associations are composed of voluntary uh, employers so employer associations mean that the employers can get together as well. It's not just the workers who can get together and form trade unions. The employers could get together. Uh, now this um, could be very serious for the workers. The employers if they got together could for example blacklist some worker and say the worker is a troublemaker or the worker doesn't, uh, doesn't try hard or causes problems wherever he or she goes. Now that could be quite serious, serious for the person who's blacklisted, because it may be unfair for a start. It may be based on the prejudice of one employer. So the employer associations have to be careful that what they're attempting to do is fair and decent and honest. However, they do share common interests and uh, facilitate trade communications and representation within the same industry it's 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 a good idea for employers to get together if they are trying to promote the area promote that part of the country promote promote industry in the area promote training and perhaps uh, 
economic development, trying to build up the infrastructure of the area, and uh, because workers will benefit as well, they'll have greater employment opportunities, they'll have greater security of employment. But the individual employers will also benefit because they're acting as a group and they're able to put pressure on the government to uh, stop unfair practices, perhaps in international trade, or stop unfair practices uh, because the trade unions have uh, adopted unfair practices as they see them. So there's a logic for employers coming together. Employer associations are open to organisations of all sizes. The role of these associations is to support and consult uh, matters regarding industry concerns and workforce welfare. So employer associations and federations um, they are they're good because there's one central place that the trade unions know they can go to to speak to one committee to try and get the agreement of that committee or that that organization and if they get an agreement it'll filter down to all the members of that organization and if any member objects to to what that agreement was then that particular employer will stand out from the rest could be ostracized in fact by the other employers so it's it's a good idea that the trade unions within the area uh, are able to talk to employer associations within the area and get local agreements ones that suit them in that particular locality the aim of the association is to give advice on matters concerning employee relations, disputes, trade, collective agreements and decision making. So the employer associations benefit because the individual members are kept up to date about current employee relations matters. They're able to talk about disputes and how to resolve disputes and talk about trade issues and collective agreements with the uh, employees and talk about decision making and, and how to move forward. So the, em the employers have come together as well. So now we can see we have moved away from individual employers and individual workers because that was unfair to the individual worker. They didn't have much power compared to the employer. So the workers came together, formed trade unions and now the trade union dealt with the employer. But then the trade unions start to form into uh, associations which are much wider and the employers form into associations which are much wider. So there is a, an overarching agreement about conditions of employment, redundancy, health and safety and so on that filter down to all the members and everyone's aware of these. Eventually they can become the law of the country. The government will take the current practices as agreed between the employers and the employees and form it into legislation. The Advisory Conciliation and Arbitration Service known as ACAS, while associations uh, can also be third party such as the government, they set a legislative framework which promotes employee and employer rights. So the, the government sets the uh, the ground the groundwork. The, the government sets out the the area. Um, it tries to ensure that there's fairness, fairness to the employers, fairness to the workers. And within that framework, negotiations could take place. The government also established ACAS. So it's the government who brought ACAS into existence. Uh, it's an agency which facilitates and acts as advisory between employees and employers. Normally ACAS is uh, a source of information, a source of research, it's a source of uh, conciliation. It tries to bring the two sides together, get them to work together. Sometimes when there are disputes there doesn't seem to be any solution. The two sides are too far apart. The negotiations are too wide. They, they can't bridge the issue between them, which leads to a dispute. It leads to 
uh, workers going on strike, it leads to damage to the uh, companies and so on. So ACAS may be involved. And ACAS gets involved, uh, they could negotiate with the two of them to try and find a solution which is acceptable to both. Or sometimes they could arbitrate. They could simply get an agreement from both sides that ACAS will listen to both sides independently and objectively listen to the case made by both sides, by the employers on the one side and the employees on the other side, listen to the case as set out and then ACAS will make a decision which one is right and the other side will accept it because they have agreed to it. That's not necessarily the best way forward because the grievance will still continue and it may be it will manifest itself in other ways in the near future. But ACAS tries to resolve issues, tries to uh, keep both sides talking and keep them engaged so that solutions can emerge. So ACAS was designed to promote positive relations in employee relations matters. It's, it's trying to reconcile the two sides, reconcile differences and ensure the two sides work together. It's an independent organisation run by an elected council. It's not owned by the trade unions or run by the trade unions or run by the employers. It's it's quite independent and it's, uh, uh, it's run by an elected council, people who are respected on both sides, from the trade union side and from the employer side. Uh, so these people will uh, form the committees that will listen to disputes. It can be approached by trade unions or by the employers in the case of disputes. Um, it can be used in collective bargaining and in negotiations. It's there for, in any form it can be used, constructive form. It, it tries to reconcile both sides to bring about equitable solutions, fair solutions to industrial problems. It has the authority to investigate claims by trade unions, uh, employee representatives and employers. So if, if an employer makes, uh, makes a claim, of some sort of claims that the trade unions are not behaving fairly, ACAS can investigate it to see if it's true. The trade unions may make a claim that the employers are gone back on an agreement, they're, they're cheating on an agreement they had before, whatever, in which case ACAS can investigate that. So ACAS constantly uh, is involved if both sides or if one of the sides want it to be involved. It's there to help. It's there to help both sides to try and bring about fair solutions, equitable solutions. Now pressure groups. Well pressure groups are non-governmental organisations, NGOs they play a significant role in employee relations. Pressure groups come into existence for all sorts of reasons. Because people see issues that they feel are wrong and they want to influence uh, government, they want to influence employers, they want to influence the trade unions. They could be aimed at any one or, or all of those organisations they simply want to make people aware of an unfairness or of some issue and they want it dealt with. So we can imagine uh, grouping pressure groups under various headings. There are some very famous ones. Uh, Oxfam, anti-slavery. We, we think of slavery in the past but slavery exists in the 21st century. People are being abused in the 21st century and kept under terrible conditions, working conditions, right throughout the world. It's not just in, in some remote countries. In the advanced world it happens as well. It could be domestic workers who have been paid very little and mistreated. Uh, so anti-slavery is, is an important issue. Greenpeace, trying to preserve the planet, it's a pressure group. And these pressure groups trying to bring an awareness of issues and, and 
they're constantly highlighting the problems, problems of child labour and sweatshops. We know that sometimes we get products from certain countries, products which are very cheap. Why are the products so very cheap? How come the developed world can't make the same products as cheaply? Maybe the answer is very simple. Maybe the workers are not being paid, or not being paid a lot. So we have child labour perhaps, we have sweatshops, people working ridiculous hours, working 12 hours a day, perhaps 6 days a week or 7 days a week. We could have wage discrimination where uh, gender, where, where uh, females are paid less than males, doing the same job, but paid less. And what is the logic of that? Well, there is none. So pressure groups come into existence to, to try and bring fairness into the employment situation. To make people aware, make customers aware, make governments aware, make trade unions aware, make employers aware, make everyone aware that these situations exist. They have established the need for corporate social responsibility employment related issues, uh, consumer protection and consumer protest and they also organise boycotts of particular products and uh, demonstrations and they, they emphasise the need for proper labour practices. The whole idea of corporate social responsibility, that companies behave properly, that's laudable that is very good. But if, if only one country does it, then the employers in that country in a sense are disadvantaged. They'll have higher costs because they're being good. So their morality is more important than the profits. But what's needed is that this is adopted universally. Now poor countries who need to have exports to uh, to pay the bills and, and to enable them to import essential items and so on. In the drive to have the exports, they may have very lax working conditions. They may have very lax employee protection regimes. And that's why pressure groups come into existence, to disseminate information about what is uh, what's happening in various countries. Now this was quite a long talk about the role of trade unions and the importance of trade unions and um, the functions of trade unions and looked at some associations associated with the trade union movement, pressure groups and uh, staff associations and so on and the employers as well. It's a it's an overall general view of the development of employee relations and we can see immediately the complexity that's involved in this because of uh, with increased globalization and increased trade flows between countries uh, the issues become more international and hence far more complex. But uh, the fact that it's it happens in practice means we need to deal with it and we need to understand it and this is our our first approach to this one. So quite an important class, go back over it, make your own notes, uh, do some reading on the subject and um, try to develop a very balanced approach to, to the topic and look at the, the various issues, the important issues that come out of this study. That's all we're going to deal with in this session, so I'm going to leave it at that and, as usual, say thank you for watching.